Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for what I know will be an amazing discussion on GPT-3 and large language models. I know there's a lot of interest in this topic. I'm Nikki McManus, member of the HBS Healthcare Alumni Association, and I'm here today with Trishan Ponch, president of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We're excited to be collaborating again today um, across our respective alumni associations. This is the fourth event in the series. The last three events can be accessed on YouTube. And thanks for joining if you've already watched these or go watch them. Today, we're bringing together our expert panelists to talk about the progress made so far and what it will take to realize the potential of this technology in healthcare. On the logistics front, thank you to Susan, Calcio, and Marielle and the rest of the team behind the scenes. Um, we will have time for questions after hearing from our panel. It's a 90-minute session, so at about an hour in, we will have questions uh, from the audience. And please start typing your questions now. Um, please type those in the Q&A, not in the chat, or move them over if you can. Um, this session is being recorded, and you can find information about our upcoming programs on both of our websites. I'll hand over to Trisha now so that he can tee up our amazing panelists. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Nikki. Um, I'd like to, you know, uh, reiterate uh, Nikki's message of welcome and also, oh, that's, that's my Google Home talking to me. Um, uh, okay, so um, <laughs> that's embarrassing. I have to close the door. It's, um, uh, yeah, okay, so, so welcome aboard. So I think um, uh, we're going to kind of go through a bit of a gentle introduction here, uh, based on the fact that a few of you reached out to us um, and saying like, look, this is cool, but I don't know what GPT-3 is. I don't know what a large language model is. I don't even know what AI is. And I feel I'll be like left behind in this conversation. So um, I guess the first thing is everyone is welcome. We've got like, um, this is the record number of participants we had. It's almost 800, which is almost double what we had last time, which we were really happy with. Um, that means you you are all tuning in from uh, the middle of your day, the morning, if you're on the West Coast, the afternoon or the evening, if you're elsewhere in the world. Um, and we really appreciate you doing so. We appreciate there's lots of other things you could be doing with your time that you've chosen to do this. And I hope you'll enjoy the discussion. Um, equally, some of you will be listening to us from the future because you're gonna be watching this on YouTube. So welcome to you as well. Um, and we're gonna go through some uh, terms that people asked us, well, what does any of this stuff mean? Um, and I'm going to do it in a very kind of idiosyncratic way, and you might just have to humor me for a little bit. So I'm Trisha, as Nikki said, I'm president of the Alumni Association. I guess my background is uh, digital health, started and sold a company, a bit of educational stuff at HSBH. We do a course, Applied AI in Healthcare. And before that, I was, uh, you know, the first kind of half of my career was in primary care. Uh, so um, these are the terms that we've been asked to, uh, to define. Um, and what I'm going to do, because I guess they are definitions, I'm going to actually read from the slides. I don't typically like to do because it's a bit dry, but um, there's a reason for doing it. And you might just have to humor me for a few minutes, if you don't mind. So, OK, AI, first thing. And what, what is AI? What is ML? Um, so, OK, so artificial intelligence, AI, refers to the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are designed to think and act like humans. AI system. So firstly, there are other canonical definitions which differ from this, but I'm giving you this one, this kind of more colloquial one for now. Uh, AI systems are trained to perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, and language translation. I'm sure all of you have used these applications. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are used into interchangeably in practice, but that is controversial. AI existed before ML, machine learning, and machine learning existed before deep learning, the specific technique of machine learning that has arguably led to this kind of new blooming of um, AI techniques. So then what is NLP? Um, so NLP has other meanings, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, we're not referring to that here. We're referring to NLP meaning natural language processing. And it's a branch of AI that deals with the interaction between computers and humans in natural language. It involves the development of algorithms and models that enable computers to process, understand, and generate human language. NLP is used for tasks such as text classification, uh, so finding like particular uh, subjects in text, uh, sentiment analysis, um, the sentiment of text, analyzing the sentiment of text, machine translation, that's, also, that's basically what's behind Google Translate and other similar products, uh, language A to language B. Um, uh, name density recognition, again, finding broader concept or sorry, more specific concepts um, uh, in language and answering questions based on a kind of knowledge base, asking a question, returning, Results. So that's natural language processing. Large language models, they're almost there, everyone. 
Uh, large language models are a type of AI model that has been trained on a large amount of text data to generate and predict words or phrases. So that generation and prediction is absolutely core here. Uh, so, uh, so predicting the next thing in a sequence and, and using that set of techniques to generate kind of new things that humans find useful. Um, LLMs, large language models, we'll use that term a lot, LLMs, uh, are used in NLP applications to improve the accuracy and fluency of language generation and understanding tasks. Examples of LLMs include GPT-3. You've all heard of it, of course, by now. Uh, generative pre-trained transformer three, uh, implying that there was number one and number two before that, which were less successful because none of, most of you, the vast majority will never have heard of them or use them. Uh, by OpenAI, uh, which is an independent company started off as a not-for-profit, is a for-profit company as it got a strong alliance with Microsoft. And BERT, um, which is an older model that stands for bi-directional encoder representations from transformers by Google. Now that term transformer, I think we're just going to leave as a black box. It doesn't refer to robots on, in disguise or any of that stuff. It's basically a specific computer science technique um, uh, for looking at large amounts of data with figuring out which bits of data are important, uh, uh, embedding things in a way that makes them uh, useful in terms of predicting this next thing in a sequence, the kind of underlying trick behind um, uh, large language models. Okay, last one. What is GPT-3 and why is, it, why is it an inflection point in AI? Like why are we here, right? So GPT-3, Generative Pre-trained Transformer 3, as we just discussed, is a large language model, we now know what that means, developed by OpenAI, and we know who they are. It is considered an inflection point in AI because of its unprecedented size and ability to perform a wide range of language tasks with remarkable accuracy. GPT-3 has been trained on a massive amount of text data, effectively kind of all of the text data on the internet, and has the capacity to generate human-like text, translate languages, summarize text, answer questions, and perform other language-related tasks with remarkable accuracy. And many of these tasks are, not, are directly, you can't trace the provenance to the data that it saw. So there's some other kind of capacities, and we'll get into that with the professor who we have um, uh, on the panel as well. Uh, the release of GPT-3 has sparked a lot of excitement and interest in the AI community, as well as broader society, because of its potential to change the way we interact with technology and revolutionize many industries. And we'll talk about it off case specifically here. Additionally, the fact that GPT-3 can perform multiple language tasks without being explicitly programmed to do so, what I just discussed, highlights the potential of AI to continue learning and improving without explicit instruction. So, you might believe us, you might not, but I think if this kind of changes your mind a little bit, all of those responses, all of those slides are generated uh, by GPC-3. Uh, I did some minor kind of editing for kind of context and flow, but it's very minor. Uh, and um, yeah, we only got the request to do this morning. I was like, I think I've got a good way of doing this. Um, but like, what, is it, what does any of this stuff mean in healthcare, right? So, um, and we'll get onto this in the panel. So, I mean, so, there's been a, a massive acceleration, both in the core techniques and in their application in healthcare um, uh, over the last year. I mean, I mean, every month there's something being added, but equally, like I think over the last year and a half or so, like uh, particularly, and certainly the last two years. Uh, and so we have David here, who's the senior author on this paper, uh, which shows how large language models um, with a few examples, that's the few shot, uh, can extract data from unstructured clinical data, which is basically what's in EMRs, the vast majority of stuff that's in EMRs, the vast majority of useful things, useful things arguably from a clinician's point of view that has really largely been kind of opaque to um, uh, computational approaches to, to understand what's going on there. We've relied on like structured data, which is the small minority of things and also requires uh, a lot of friction for clinicians to add. So that was, you know, and so they, they, David and, and his team describe a way of doing that in the research literature um, earlier last year. And then recently, much more recently, um, in fact, just towards the end of last year, our, our friend Alec, Alan Clark Salingham and team at Google um, uh, applied a related set of techniques, these same large language models, um, encoding clinical knowledge um, uh, by training them on a retraining these general models on a, uh, on a on a more clinical data set and also structuring how you put the queries into the models and they found the thing that I think many of you have seen in the press about it can get like two-thirds or some kind of impressive score that's about 20 percent greater than the benchmark in the US MLE. Um, I looked at some of the questions I think probably now it can get a better score than me um, I don't know what that 
really says about whom. Um, uh, then, of course, like last week, uh, we had um, this week, sorry, not last week. <laughs> um, uh, we had this thing, bio, bio GPT, which I guess, as you all know now, because you know kind of roughly how these things work. That's the GPT model that is underpinning chat GPT and all those things retrained on PubMed this time, or trained on PubMed. And um, uh, it's beat the previous benchmark. And what that means, what it really means, if you look on the right of the screen, now this, this text thing is something that I have written thousands of times. Uh, many of the physicians here will be very familiar. So a 65 year old patient, female patient with a past medical history of, that's a very common thing you write in a clinical note. And this is the autocomplete. Uh, now that's, you know, that may not be right for this individual patient, but with a bit of understanding of the past context of that patient, which is all structured data, right? It's in uh, current problems and past history and all that stuff. You can kind of see where this is going, I hope. And this is like, this is real stuff. We can um, point you in the direction of where you can play around this with you, uh, play around with this yourself. And you can even implement it yourself if you are so inclined. So we're going to get into a very interesting discussion. I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. They're all uh, friends of mine. They're all people I respect hugely. I'm sure you'll uh, kind of get on uh, uh, with them all. We're going to try and have a kind of free form esque, um, uh, free, free form ish, excuse me, discussion um, and try and unpack some of the more kind of detailed concepts as they come up, which they're going to. Um, and then we'll, get, we'll have some time, like we'll finish at the top of the hour at one o'clock and then we'll have some time for you all to um, ask uh, questions, which Nikki will collate, and then we can kind of um, uh, kind of curate the next side of the uh, discussion after that. So um, if you want to find out more um, uh, about this, David has got an excellent course that is on MIT OpenCourseWare uh, on machine learning for healthcare. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, Heather and I also teach a course here at HSBH, uh, which we're doing again in May. We did uh, last month. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we would kind of point you in that direction. If you want these slides, um, I mean, you can make them yourself, I'll show them to you, of course, but, but if you don't want to do that and you just want them from me, then just send me an email and I will send them to you. Um, so uh, good stuff. All right, so let's um, stop the share uh, and get back to it. So um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, let's just go kind of through with some introductions. If you could just tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do, Maybe even a little bit about how you got there, if it's um, yeah, if you feel so motivated, and uh, yeah, we'll just kind of go around the thing. So I, if you don't mind, I'll just call on you in the order that you're kind of on my screen. So, uh, Silo, you've got the dubious privilege. So you've got the dubious privilege of being first. Great. Hi, everybody. Really excited to be here. I think lots to unpack in even just the few short slides that Trishan shared. I'm I'm Silo Chalapelli. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Mendel AI. And for folks that are not familiar, Mendel is a, is, we're a small healthcare technology company that's effectively building an AI platform and tools to unlock structured data and insights from unstructured clinical data that, you know, as we talked about, makes up a big part of patient clinical records today and you know, contains an incredibly rich information about that patient's journey. Um, and just it, you know, to how I got here, I actually started off in computer science and, and pre-med though, Unlike some of my, my uh, fellow panelists, I didn't quite make it to med school um, and instead started down this path of really working in and around healthcare technology and healthcare data in a number of different areas. I started off in about 10 years of consulting with or working for large health systems, academic medical centers, where a big part of that work was on driving adoption of EMRs and technology. And then actually transitioned over to the healthcare technology side, thought it might be a, a more direct path to, you know, to kind of learn and, and hopefully make some impact here of how do you actually use that data now that people have now started to collect in droves to improve quality and access to care and really drive better decision making through real world evidence. So Great. Very Thank relevant you. topics for us. You're welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, okay, Heather. Hey everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Heather Maddy. I'm a lecturer on biostatistics and co-director of the Health Data Science Master's Program at the Harvard Chan School. Uh, what that means is I basically do a ton of teaching for health data science, um, mentoring of students, and research. Uh, my research areas are predominantly network science, um, clinical data science, and algorithmic bias. Um, I've taught machine learning courses, deep learning courses, um, just a ton of stuff. Um, I also get to consult and I get to work with people like Trishan and write very interesting papers. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I was going to mention something else, but I think that's it. <laughs> okay, well, if it comes to you, we can, we can go back because we've got time. Um, all right, Gaurav. Hey, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Gaurav Singhal. Um, I guess I'm CLU's counterfactual. I was pre-med in computer science, um, studied robotics, um, made it to med school for better or for worse. Um, and uh, and basically for the last 15 years or so, I have lived two lives. Um, one is as a practicing doc. I see patients here in Boston at the Brigham Women's Hospital. And, and the other side of my life has been building companies at the intersection of healthcare, data, and tech. Um, worked on natural language processing over a decade ago using regular expressions, which you didn't put on that slide for probably good reason, Trishan. Um, uh, but but got to see sort of how that could have an impact both on the research side and the clinical side. Um, spent many years at Foundation Medicine, cancer genomics company, served as their chief data officer. Um, worked a lot on real-world data with Flatiron Health and uh, figuring out how structuring unstructured data um, could be valuable. Worked at Salu there. And now spend my time advising uh, and investing in a couple dozen different companies across the healthcare data ecosystem, many of whom uh, could be radically different if the promise of large language models uh, comes to be. So delighted to have this conversation with so many great people. Uh, thanks Ooh. for having me. Cheers, Gaurav. That's great. Um, David? Similarly, very happy to be here, and thank you for the invitation. So my name is David Sontag. I am a professor at MIT. I've been uh, faculty for about 12 years now, and I lead about a 20-person research group in AI and healthcare, where we look at what one could do if you had data from electronic medical records on patients spanning decade. How could we learn using machine learning algorithms, models of how disease progression progresses, how treatment changes that disease progression, and then ultimately how can we get into the loop, into the clinical loop, uh, where clinicians are working with electronic medical records and bring that AI in to actually change clinical outcomes and improve operational efficiencies. Uh, so. I've been in this space for a long time, and uh, over a decade ago, when I first started getting into it, we realized quickly on that most of the value of what we needed was in clinical notes. So we needed to develop algorithms to really extract knowledge from clinical notes. And uh, over the past uh, few years, we've been making quite a few advances, recently really using large language models. Uh, and I just spun out a company from MIT, so I am uh, now CEO of a company which is bringing large language model uh, ideas into healthcare, uh, very much around the lines of what we're talking about today. And then also I, I teach, uh, so when I'm, I'm on sabbatical now, but when I'm not on sabbatical, I teach MIT's undergraduate and graduate machine learning classes, and I teach the graduate machine learning for healthcare class. Amazing. Cool, David. Thank you so much. I mean, if you don't mind, if we if we could start with you, I guess, it, you know, it's... Um, uh so um okay so i guess you know we kind of covered it a little bit in the intro slides in my very hacked way but in your more kind of professorial way um the question would be like so what are large language models sure uh okay so um i have a six-year-old son and if i were to tell you um my son his name is diego uh diego was riding his bike fell off his bike and began to blank what would blank be? And everyone could just pull up your chat. I see you all have it. You know, what would you write for blank? Cry. So I see a lot of cries. Um, some people say bleed, uh, but generally speaking, except for the person who said celebrate, we all seem to be on the same page that there's some amount of pain involved. And this is something that we can do really well as humans because we have context. We know that children, if they fall off a bike, would tend to cry. I mean, adults would as well. Uh, and we understand something about language, like we have an idea, well, um, there's like, you know, after began to what set, what types of words would typically appear after that, um, what words would be associated with bicycle and so on. And so the way that these large language models are trained are actually very much along that line. So they take every single publicly available document on the web. And there are uh, corpuses called the common crawl, for example, which have, which in essence, have created these gigantic data sets of every single web page on the internet that's publicly available. And they develop what are called surrogate tasks. So it's very hard to get labeled data in machine learning, but it's really easy to come up with a task of, given any sequence of words, predict what the next word is. So we spoke about predicting the last word, cry, but I could have also asked, Diego, Diego fell off his bike and blank, and you might have said the word began or something else, right? So for any sequence of words, you can ask, what is the next word? And the way that these models are trained are in that in that way. So they're trained to take every single sequence of words on the internet and predict what is the next word. Um, and 
you might wonder how does that, you know, if you could do that really well, predict the next word, how does that help you with anything that we might care about? Um, well, suppose I then, you know, some, I know some of you are, are, uh, have some health experience. Um, if I told you the following, uh, okay, I'm about to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a clinical scenario and I want to tell you the patient, I want you to tell me the patient's diagnosis. The clinical scenario is the following. The patient comes in with these symptoms, A, B, C, and D. Um, what is their differential diagnosis? Question mark. Now, if you were to then fill in the next few words, the next few words in that sentence, the completion is going to be most likely a diagnosis or the answer to those questions. And so if you can take any problem that you care about and you can turn it into a question, which is of the nature, here's a sequence of words, what's the next few words? If you can turn it into that type of problem, then you can answer that type of problem with large language models. And what's fascinating about the current, um, of current advances is that once these models get big enough, they actually do a really good job at answering those questions. And they, they do it across a wide range of, um, of domains. And the way that I think about it um, in terms of, you know, well, how is it even possible? Well, let's think about the following. If you had a question, something that you wanted to know the answer to, and you went to Google or Bing or your favorite search engine, and you asked it and you sort of came up with the right search query and you looked through the results, how often would you be able to answer that question? Typically, the answer is quite high. And I know going back even five, 10 years ago, when I was working on machine learning algorithms on clinical notes, I always dreamed of being able to have Google in the loop of my algorithms. Like if only I could ask, what does this acronym, medical acronym mean on Google, I would be able to find the answer very quickly. But of course, I could never send protected health information to Google. So that was never an option. But now these models, which have been trained on all of the same information that search engines make available, suddenly have this knowledge base that allow you to get to make and, you, and ways of an, accessing that knowledge base that allow you to do all of these things that have never been possible before. Excellent. Okay, David. I mean, I guess one, one question, uh, immediate question from that. I mean, um, so it's a leading question. I think we know, <laughs> know the answer, of course, but like that mechanism you're talking about of predicting the next in the sequence, is it unique to words or can other things be predicted as well? Yeah, we'll let other people enter. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we could, uh, we could do that. But um, Gaurav? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, David's the expert here. Obviously, we've seen a lot of this stuff happen with images as well, with Dali and a lot of the stuff that's come out over the last couple of months. Um, and what I think is interesting, and David, say a little, Heather, I'd be curious for your thoughts. It feels like, number one, we've eclipsed a, a certain sort of uh, plateau of, holy cow, this is cool, right, in terms of the technical abilities and scientific abilities. But in addition to that, it sort of entered the public dialogue in a way that, you know, I can't think of another technology that has in the last few years. Um, and, and and you know imaging first i think with dali and lenza and, and you know the avatars that are floating around the internet now and and i gave to my family members for christmas um and uh and 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 now all the stuff with language and the applications to healthcare i think there's almost like a collective intelligence that's emerged around this as the internet plays with all these tools many of which are now you know available microsoft as you as you pointed out just posted their uh their uh, their sandbox to play with their uh their bio gpt platform and I'd be very curious to hear everybody's thoughts on, you know, as you all have played with it and you've seen others sort of interrogate it, uh, what's real and what's not, right? And initially it seemed like magic. Um, and, uh, and I think David knows better than anybody, it's not magic. Um, and so wh where where's the curtain, I guess? So, uh, you know, I'd be curious for people's thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so Heather, I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of following on from Boris's question. So if it's not magic, what are they actually learning? Like what? What is it? Is it like, is it just the prediction of the next token in the sequence or is there something like deeper that's being understood? It's really, I mean, it depends on, on the data that it's trained with. So it, you're only, it only has the information that it's been given um, and making a probabilistic, you know, choice of the next word um, based on the context of the data that it's been given. Um, and so it's not learning anything. It's, I mean, it's learning context, it's from, but it's not learning as you go, as it generates, um, it's just generating. Um, and so I did think it was magic, but then once I started asking a couple of more questions, I'm like, this is out of my field house now, or my wheelhouse, I don't actually know if this is correct. How would, 
do I trust this to be correct? Do I go to Google now and like see what Google says? What if you have two completely different or opposing uh, conclusions from medical papers? How does it reconcile those things? So it, it was definitely really cool and it still is very cool, but the, the magic is starting to kind of wear off and I'm getting very skeptical as we go. Um, skeptical why, Heather? Just where is the information coming from? How is it generating these insights or these this text, these answers? Is there some sort of bias creeping in? Um, who has determined if this answer is suitable or not harmful, which I know we'll talk about a lot later on, um, but who is saying that this this is okay to use and deploy um, and, you know, trust this. We can't put all of our trust into something. We have to actually um, kind of yeah. judge it for ourselves as well. But if you know nothing about the subject, that's a little scary, I think. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Um, so, thoughts? Yeah, no, I think a lot of what Heather said resonates a lot because, and again, David's, you should correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think large language models, they, they're not necessarily learning, right? Like they don't have a data model or a hierarchy that they're using to put all of the information that they're collecting in context with each other. It's just, it's kind of summarizing what they've been trained on and what they've been trained on are words next to each other or paragraphs next to each other, not, you know, kind of entire documents or records right now. So I think there's some limitations in what it's what it, you know it's not really understanding right like it's, it's it's playing back what it knows and so to heather's point depending on the data that you're feeding it how current the data is that it was trained on and you know how you ask the question i think does dictate or will influence the answers that you get back and how relevant those answers are so you know but you know again like to what gore said early on i'm i am optimistic about the space i think there's been incredible advances and i'm Super excited to see where this can go, but yeah. I also am, you know, kind of cautiously optimistic, and I want to make sure we think about what are the applications today, and what are some of the limitations um, in in how we can use it today versus as the technology gets better, we can start to expand that. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Hey, I mean, Trisha, can I can I jump in with just a quick okay. comment? Um, and I'd like to we're we're, da we're dangerously close to I think. Having to define learning and intelligence, which maybe exactly, yeah. we, we should all avoid, um, <laughs> or or we'll veer off. But that's second, where I wanted to go. Yeah. Oh well, I'll let you go there, David. Then uh, that's that's above my pay grade. Um, there's a there's another thing that I've been thinking about, and curious how people react to it, which is, um, I've almost seen two modes in which um, the technology has been used again in sort of the public domain as people talk about it. One is um, I I have content, and I want ChatGPT to do something with it, right? So. It, it takes something long and summarize it, take something short and expand on it, right? I'll give you a prompt for a story or a limerick or a rap, Trishan, as you did last time, and, and yeah. generate more, better, sort of cleaner content, right? Um, and, and there you have the benefit of providing content and, and being able to adjudicate the outcome, right? And really leveraging what the thing does best. Um, and, and so that, that one seems straightforward, safe. People have done a lot of it and great, right? Lots of cool applications in healthcare and otherwise. There's the second the second side of it, which is where things get complicated, which is I'm not going to give you the content. I want you to return the content, right? And and it's almost like the sort of like bar argument question resolved by Google that you were alluding to earlier, right? Um, like what's the capital of Denmark, right? Where like, okay, I can like browse the results and or, you know, how big is, you know, the Eiffel Tower? Or I, I can like look at the results and have some sort of sanity check or, you know, multiple responses look the same and I can adjudicate the result. Um, the problem comes, especially in healthcare, in my opinion, where you ask it for content, and because it's so eloquent, how does one adjudicate the response, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if there's no show your work, and the references can be confabulated, um, and it sounds really good, right? So I I'm very curious. Like, there's one which is, again, given content, generate something related, and the other is given a prompt, generate the content or provide the content. Um, th that part feels not an insurmountable. But it feels like where I've seen the community struggle and hit roadblocks, it's in the latter. So I don't know. It's a framing that I, I've started to adopt. Curious how other people. Yeah. yeah. Can I jump in there? Yeah. 
Uh, so, so I, I, I want to touch on both of the points that have been raised by uh, by Heather, Sidhu, and, and Gaurav. Um, so, so the first about learning, I, I think we need to ask, well, how do humans learn? Like, what does learning mean? And of course, first of all, I am no expert on that, but you know, humans learn from a variety of signals, uh, not just from speech. We also experience, we act in the world. Uh, so, you know, there are very big differences between the modalities of data that are available to learn from a text-based corpora versus the way humans learn. That said, we shouldn't underestimate the diversity and extreme cases of examples that are present in text data. Uh, so you will find, for example, documents in the web that teach you how to do algebra that teach you how to add numbers, divide. You'll find documents on the uh, internet that, you know, that are intended for medical education. Um, so you'll find uh, documents that, uh, in, that really explicitly walk through reasoning steps. And so with the huge diversity of data that is available as textual data on, on the internet, in fact, many of the things that we might think about, well, how would you learn that the data actually is available in some place to try to start to learn some of those aspects. Um, so that that's that's just one comment on the learning question. Um, and the second comment, which we can get into much more throughout uh, throughout the session, many of the concerns that that are being raised here are ones that the AI research community are very actively working towards and are in some sense very easy lifts from where we are currently today. So questions such as how current is the data that is driving these models? Well, it's an, it's an actually pretty simple leap to take a, a model like ChatGPT and to plug it into a database or to plug it into a search engine or any other source of recent data or PubMed with the latest articles, for example, where instead of having to rely on data that, that existed before, while it was trained, allow it to even query new information given results. In fact, there have been a number of papers and systems that have been developed recently doing exactly that. And the second question of, well, where's the evidence or backup for this coming from? Again, the research community has moved toward a new class of models that provide references for any one finding. So could you, instead of giving an answer that is just generated based on the model itself, can you generate a model that's grounded in something that's been stated on the internet so that you can then provide a URL to where that evidence can be found? Again, there have been papers and now existing systems that are doing that. And then finally, we talked about reasoning and you know, how do you adjudicate the, your, your reasoning, your work, as, as Gaurav just mentioned. Well, if you go to um, ChatGPT and you uh, ask a question, but then at the very end, you say, uh, explain step by step, and you simply add those few words, you're going to get a very different type of output where it'll actually give in bulleted form the steps of reasoning that might lead to the conclusion. Now, those steps of reasoning are not always correct, but it starts to, but it's it's surprisingly good, and it starts to provide um, some of the evidence that one might need in, in order to try to bring together your human knowledge with what the with the AI uh, knows about. So, so, so David, just to kind of so, is the inference here that those steps of reasoning are described by by people in text documents that are available on the internet? So therefore, that's the that's the that's largely the conjecture, yes. Although interestingly, um, some of the phrases that could be used to elicit that step by step reasoning don't actually appear anywhere on the internet, uh, okay. or appear very very infrequently. So there is a gap in our understanding currently. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, okay. I mean, I, I think uh, I guess you know. We should kind of move on to thinking about applications, really, like you know, ab applications in healthcare, uh, um, in particular healthcare, healthcare and life sciences, of course, like thinking broadly. Um, so maybe I'll ask the kind of broad question first. Like, I'm a healthcare executive running a, a hospital or a payer or a pharmaceutical company, and I'm thinking this all sounds great. Um, clearly, there's something going on here. I keep hearing about these large language models all the time. Every time I turn on the news or you know, my kids telling me about it, et cetera. Um, what am I likely to actually see in the next five years that I can like touch or not touch, maybe it's the wrong way of putting it, but that I can like put into my organization? Does anyone have a go at that? 
I can take a stab, Trisha, or Salu, please go ahead since you're actually working on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, yeah, I can start and again, like welcome yeah. everyone's thoughts on this. I mean, I think just given some of the, you know, the strengths and limitations that we're seeing today, I think some of the ideas of where, where it feels like there are some uh, real applications are in things like where these LLM models can be used to retrieve data or summarize data, I think are kind of natural leaps. So for example, patient engagement, right? Like I think everyone's experience or expectation of how to get information is shifting from you know, 5, 10, 20 years ago, where it was you were writing words and expecting search results to being able to actually ask questions in common language and expecting results. So, so can we make that available more readily in, you know, kind of healthcare websites or engagement tools that are now being offered, like mobile apps that patients have access to of how do we get information about their condition or the care they can expect to receive in kind of common situations um, or even on the provider side, as they're trying to digest massive amounts of information around, you know, recent publications that have been published on specific topics. Or, you know, I saw this example of where um, a provider used an example, uh, kind of gave a couple of inputs and, and had ChatGPT generate a beautiful ER discharge summary. And especially with all the you know, kind of recent debates around physician burnout and the burden that documentation is placing on physicians. So are there ways to start using some of these tools to you know, kind of play back information that is common and you know, kind of readily accessible in a, in a much more digestible way feels, feels real? Um, yeah. And you know, maybe I'll pause there and then we can talk about what some- Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I mean David, if, if, if you wouldn't mind if I went over to you, I know like, you know, as you said earlier, you've got a number of horses in this race. So, so yeah, it'd be good to kind of hear where you see it going. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll jump on a couple of the things that Silu mentioned, and then I have others that I won't get into now. We can get into in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so, so Silu mentioned patient engagement, and uh, just one example of that. Uh, my lab at MIT is building a browser plugin. So this will be for Chrome initially, uh, that will recognize anytime you navigate to a electronic medical record patient portal, and open up the clinical note. And then it will take that clinical note that's shown in the browser and it will do a couple of things. First, it will translate it from clinical speak to patient speak, um, recognizing that it's very hard for patients to understand their notes, um, that the uh, 21st Century Cures Act has now made it available and made patient uh, clinical notes available to patients in a widespread fashion that was never possible, never available before. And that there's a huge opportunity to improve engagement with patients if we could help them better understand those notes, understand the actions they could take based on those notes. Even just understanding, you know, you come home from, the, from a doctor visit and you're like, what the heck just happened to me? What am I supposed to do next? Right? If we could, you know, that a lot of that information is in the note. And if we could just get that translated into a way that patients can understand and appreciate, we think it could be really powerful. So we're building that right now. Um, it's doing things like, you know, taking acronyms and expanding those acronyms, get providing definitions for clinical concepts, and it's even going a step further, and this is right now what I'm going to tell you aspirational, but I think we're not that far from it. It's going to be providing questions and answers. So, you know, what are some questions that you might wonder about based on reading this node, and here are some answers, and you could imagine based on the way that Trishan was showing um, his introduction, that these could be generated quite effectively from GPT-3 um, or ChatGPT, and, and we actually already did, did some quick demos of that. Of course, all of the safety-related concerns we spoke about earlier are very much relevant to here, but we do think that this could really open a bunch of interesting doors for, for patients. Again, that's an example of something that's being done um, by my MIT research group. Um, just one more example, specifically about something that Sylu had mentioned. Um, Sylu, you, you spoke about you know, generating ER discharge summary and trying to tackle concerns of physician burnout. Uh, I think this question of how do we do text generation is really interesting. And indeed, these models are surprisingly good at generating, generating text. And so that can be done at a number of different levels. Um, we uh, already for a couple of years have had uh, in a pilot deployment at Bethlehem Deaconess Medical Center an autocomplete system where clinicians start documenting in their note and we will suggest the next few words that they might want to document. In that case, we're doing it in a very special way to gently guide clinicians to entering in the information we want them to enter. So that way, I guess you get structured data out. But you could take that a few steps further and start to imagine, oh, there's some boilerplate things in, in notes. 
that are sort of connecting the dots between notes. A lot of that we can fill in. Right now it's done via templates, but one can imagine doing a text generation approach instead. Uh, and that I think would be a potentially good fit, could have a good user experience around it. Then there are whole other levels. Like, could you just generate the full discharge summary for the patient's uh, hospitalization? Because we know so much, so much about what just happened during that visit. Like we have all the nursing progress notes, we have all of the structured data associated to what medications were uh, and interventions were performed while the patient was hospitalized. One can imagine taking that and just generating the full discharge summary, given that not that much new information might be coming in at that time. Um, and I think that would also be a future dream. Um, I say a future dream because first of all, I think we're a little bit further away from where the technology needs to be for that to be productized right now. Um, but secondly, it's not even clear whether that's the direction we want to be in as a society, right? If one could just automatically generate this note, then why are we even creating it? That, that is not necessarily the best way to be communicating with other clinicians or patients. Maybe we should be rethinking that from the bottom up. Yeah, very interesting. Can I jump in here? I, this yeah, this is incredible. First of all, David, I feel like I'm learning so much about what's actually happening here versus what I thought should happen next, which, which is uh, maybe not surprising give, given where you are. Um, a couple of thoughts. Number one, it feels like a lot of the examples David gave fall in the sort of um, the, the first bucket of at least my mental framework, which is given content, sort of process it, um, which feels like a safer place to start, right? The lay summaries is a perfect example of that. Summarization of historical course, I think, is a great example of that. Um, you know, another thing that, that I worked on, again, many years ago using regular expressions was information that's buried in the medical record from many, many years ago, right? At that point, we had, call it a decade of, of digital medical records. Now we've got two uh, decades worth. And so, you know, no physician, Trish, you know this, can go through the whole medical record when they're seeing a new patient on hospital admission. And so often you rely on whatever's been copied forward, right, to a large extent, and, you know, whatever the patient can remember as you interview them. Um, but it may be that they had a blood clot in their lungs 15 years ago for a different reason than what now shows up in the medical record. So surfacing things that are buried feels like a, a real sort of clinical value point. Um, and then I think the, the open question that David sort of left with is a really good one, which is, are summaries what we want, right? And I see this when I'm on service and I see the interns actually for pass off, which is another great application, right? Um, th they've started instead of writing a discharge summary de novo um, at discharge, they keep a running discharge summary, especially over long hospital courses, where each night the overnight intern basically summarizes one or two sentences about what happened that day. So it almost becomes like a like a like a summarized diary, right? So like on June fifth, twenty twenty two, X, Y, and Z happened, and then June sixth, this happened, and June seventh, this happened, right? Which is fine if you want to sort of just literally read through the course, and that can be useful. Um, but the idea of actually coalescing it into a, you know, and often when I write an addendum to the discharge summary, it's four or five sentences that hopefully capture the essence of what's important and what should happen next, which is very different than a transcript of, uh, of sort of the course. But both have value, and, and I'm sure David would say that you can actually do both, um, which, uh, which I think would be, would, which would be interesting. But I think the question David asked at the end of, you know, forget what it can do, what do we want it to do, yeah. right, is always, is always an important one. So let's discuss that, right? So, so Heather, I have a question for you, for you in a second. So, I mean, I think this thing of like, you know, just to be whatever, like blunt about it is like kind of automating knowing your patient. Uh, and that thing that like, I was always amazed that you just got so much better at reading loads of medical records and having a sense of what was going on. It was like this kind of super speed reading that was impossible at the beginning. And by the end, you could like review like a stack of medical records and have a good sense of it within like a couple of minutes exactly what's going on there I don't know but it's something to do but that's what you do in clinical training um, um but of course there's things that aren't represented in the medical record right there's things that the patient the the uh, maybe never going to be represented that the um doctor is going to know about the patient's preferences their cultural preferences their what this illness means in their lives and that is not going to be represented by these kind of approaches so I guess you know I have to kind of in introduce that caution here or maybe it can be maybe that can be represented in data somehow, but that's clearly an area. And that's what David was mentioning earlier about, because we can, do we want to? And it's very clear, I hope everyone's convinced from this argument that we actually can, <laughs> like, uh, this is not kind of sci-fi stuff. And David was very clear about things that are actually coming in short order um, that, will, um, uh, that will kind of move us along um, uh, down that process. But Heather, I know your, you know, a lot of your research work in algorithmic bias, is looking at, well, okay, but like who is represented in the healthcare records and how are they represented? 
Uh, and is that kind of fair, quote unquote? So could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so a big issue, again, all these models are trained on data, but where does that data come from? Who is represented in that data? And especially in the US healthcare system, there are just groups of people that do not have the same access as other groups. So they are not gonna have as many clinical notes, as many records, as much data being put into these models. Uh, so if you're underrepresented, as we say, with that amount of data for a particular group or you know, however you define the groups, um, the model's probably not going to perform as well for that group um, versus the majority group, um, just because you don't have as much information about those individuals. Uh, and so how do we make predictions or, um, you know, um, sorry, I lost the word, but um, how do we use uh, these large language models to kind of summarize information about um, one of these smaller groups and do we trust it if they're not they're, they're not represented as much as as the other groups. Excellent. Does it, do anyone else have any thoughts on this or can we move to a different different bit of conversation? So uh, okay, but I mean we're kind of I, I, I should can, oh. can I ask Heather something? Yeah. yeah. Um, Heather, I think this, you're raising a really important point. And I mean our, our field, you're in my field, has traditionally thought about this, I think, from the perspective of the data itself. Um, but here, I think what's also relevant is the knowledge sources where these models are being trained from. And so if we think about, well, where are all the case reports coming from that are published in PubMed uh, versus where's the population that you're actually going to be deploying this model on, there might be a mismatch there. So I I think even just asking that question is so important because it, it, it immediately leads to methodological approaches that one could use to try to mitigate that. So for example, one could, um, when, when training these models, attach metadata associated to them so that one could ask questions like, okay, in this population, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, but that's not possible today because that metadata isn't actually used when training those models. Yeah, I have to make a point here. It's one of my kind of pet peeves on this is that this is an issue with medicine as as is now. There's not like AI, sure, it's an issue for AI, we should hold AI to a high standard, but like who gets to be in clinical trials? Who gets to be in clinical leadership? Who gets to be treated fairly when they come into consultation room? There's extensive evidence that there's system, systematic and pervasive enduring bias in those areas. Um, so yeah, this is a kind of obviously a much broader point. I, I, I agree with that. Okay, but we, we are kind of talking now about this kind of rough area of alignment, right? Alignment of like uh, AI algorithms, large language models with the goals of humans uh, and what, what, what people or individual organizations find valuable. That sounds like a kind of difficult problem. I'm sure there must be a lot of stuff in the research uh, world around techniques to do that. Um, um, so David, yeah, would you mind kind of telling us a little bit about that? How do we make sure that, um, uh, and is there any work going on about uh, recalibrating these models to perform according, sorry, recalibrating these models according to their performance in the real world? Uh, actually, would anyone else like to check that first? It's like don't you take as my friend. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so make sure I understand the question as well. So in terms of recalibrating, you mean? Well, well you I example? guess I guess let me let me just ask you more directly. So I mean, you know, a lot of this work with uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. Ah. Why is Chat GPT better than uh, GPT three itself? Like, what's going on there? Maybe okay. Okay, yeah. So uh, so there's a technique that um, is starting to be uh, very much in the vogue in the research community. It's called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, it's not that big of a deal as it might sound uh, or be made up to be. Uh, in, in essence, what's going on here behind the scenes is the following. Uh, I alluded to how these models were trained uh, by predicting the next word, uh, but clearly uh, most use cases that we care about, whether you're doing using a large language model for a classification problem, for a summarization problem, for a text generation problem, there are typically different criteria that you might care about than just getting the words correct, right? So if you get 99% of the words correct, but 1% of the word is incredibly offensive, that's a bad thing. 
Um, and so one could then try to just gather a bit of additional data to try to fine tune your model with those human judgments in play. And there are many ways to do that. The simplest ways to do that are just supervised learning. So you have some example inputs and some example outputs, and your goal is to get those example outputs and not other ones. Um, other ways to do this would be to ask about preferences. So you might, um, what these what these companies do, I think one of the reasons why they often have these pilot betas uh, is because they are looking for lots of people to play around with these chatbots or systems. Uh, and then they'll take those and they will take the same prompts that the general public are putting into those systems. They'll look at several different outputs and then they'll go to very, very big annotation teams. We're talking about thousands of people. And they will, they will say, okay, here are a few different outputs you could imagine for this input. Which one is better? And they'll get relevance judgments. And then they'll take those relevance judgments and they'll use them to fine tune the models. Um, and so this is actually one of the things that's not spoken about so much which is that there's a huge amount of compute power being used to train these models, but there's also a huge amount of human power to be, that's being used in this um, fine tuning stage to get the right relevance judgment. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what Dave is describing there, if anyone wants to find out more, is described in much more detail in a paper that um, I think it's got like instruct GPT in the title. I can't remember what the rest of it is, but it kind of de describes this method that he's talking about. And yeah, I mean, I think there's a general point I'm sure we'd all agree on, you know, behind AI is like, there's a lot of compute power, there's a lot of energy usage, and there's also people. Um, um, and many of those people are in other countries um, who, who are doing this work as well. Um, Trisha, okay. Can I pick up on one point that David made, which I think is super fascinating, which is this um, you know, these systems are impressive because 99% of the time they're amazing, right? And the, the question in some ways, especially when you get to a problem like healthcare is, is it okay for them to be right 99% of the time and be wrong 1% of the time? I'm making up those numbers and Trish and your point about <laughs> how good how good are humans, right? We'll leave aside for you and me. But, um, but you know, um, it, it's an interesting question, right? The reasoning steps you described, David, I've seen some of those where it's like 15 steps here of how I got to my logic but the leap between step six and seven actually doesn't make any sense, right? And that's the reason that the sort of ch chain of things breaks down or, you know, it's trained on the general use cases, you get a differential diagnosis, but you're missing the one thing that actually is really important, right? But maybe more rare. So um, I suspect there's lots of ways to solve these two. And, you know, Heather, Salu, David, I know you all work on this, uh, this work, but I'm curious how you think about the sort of, um, asymmetric risk function in some ways, right? Um, and, and you know, how does that fit into the large language model universe? Yeah. Sally, do you want to pick up? Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is where the the use case is so important, right? That you're that you're applying the technology in and, and being very clear about what the strengths and limitations are of the models that you're working on. And, you know, so it, it Mendel, one of the things that we we're focused on is how do you structure unstructured data so you can unlock all of these insights about the patient's journey. And, you know, I think the AI models, you know, I'm really excited and proud of the, the progress that our models have been able to make in extracting facts from every document in the patient and then summarizing those across the patient records. And I think those can unlock answers to certain types of questions around generally across the patient population. How many patients do I have with this type of non-small cell lung cancer or of this stage, et cetera, et cetera. But then when you're trying to actually answer or try to use that data for possibly like real world evidence studies, what we have found is introducing humans in the loop is still important and necessary to get to the quality that you need to actually draw inferences and leverage that you know, kind of data on a per patient level. And the extra benefit is having the AI models do, you know, kind of 80% of the work also makes the humans that much more efficient and effective, where there's some things that AI models are actually really good at and probably better than humans. And there's some things that humans are really good at and better than AI. And if you put the two together, that's really where you start to get, I think, you know, kind of the, the most value. And so, so I know there's, this is maybe another topic is there's a lot of conversation around, are, is AI going to replace humans? And, and I actually think the better question is how do we work together and how do we make sure that we're pulling in insights and facts and knowledge that the AI is surfacing? How do we surface it in a way that humans can then, um, you know, can use it and then get to you know, a better quality answer? So I think that that's how I would think about what- Yeah, yeah. right. Human-computer hybrids, right? Um, uh, okay, so I guess uh, 
So, I mean, does everyone agree with that? I mean, there's going to be some amount of human in the loop in this in these kind of applications where there's a long tail of bad things that could happen. It sounds kind of, um, it sounds pretty- It feels unfair. to me like, Trisha, it depends on the ability to show your work. And it's, uh, you know, I was not aware that was possible, but it sounds like David, David is aware and others may be as well of sort of innovations in, in, in the sort of research domain in which that's possible. I, I completely agree. Human in the loop feels like the answer for the foreseeable future. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll eat those words in five years when humans aren't necessary anymore, but, um, but until then, you know, the question is, how does a human stay in the loop, right? When ChatGPT yeah. spits out an answer, either you already knew the answer and you look at it and you say, nope, that's not right, right? But but there has to be an audit trail, so to speak, or a show your work or references that are that are confirmed to be real, right? And can be looked up. Um, and, and it sounds like those things are in the works, which I think is great. Yeah, so, so I was thinking that, and that probably then has to be in the business model of these organizations, right? Like, which is different. There's a variable cost component related to the human in the loop that I'm not sure is people understand necessarily, you know, like the kind of classic SaaS tech play doesn't usually involve that. So this is different. The economics of these organizations are different. And they, I mean, I think that's fair to say, right? Does anyone disagree? Oh, good. All right. Fair enough. It's um, uh, good stuff. All right. So um, I guess uh, two questions uh, to come. Probably we'll only get through one, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. So. Um, if I'm a healthcare organization of any kind of stripe, should I build these kind of capabilities myself? Should I use that, make, make, make my own life? <laughs> okay, there's some reactions already. Um, uh, should I borrow other people's, i.e. take like pre-trained models, maybe open source or things that other people have? Um, or should I work with a vendor and not do any of this and, and, and buy from them? Um, so does anyone want to kind of start off with that? I know we have, uh, I mean, all of us, I guess, in some way are involved on the other side of the table, uh, the vendor side of the table to this. Um, but yeah, I know, David, would you like to start? Are you, you're you the first person to react uh, on the screen. Oh, I, I, I think I'm very much on the vendor side. So that's what our company is building. Fine, so yeah, yeah. We, we, we think that there is a very long path from getting something which gives you a reasonable result to building a product which is HIPAA compliant, which provides the relevant safety uh, uh, wraparounds that you would need in a health context, which uh, provides the human in the loop components that Silu uh, referred to a second ago, uh, and which is cheap, much cheaper than you would get by a ton of GPT-3 uh, calls uh, that you could scale in real time to millions of clinical notes and integrate back where clients actually need the data and the results. Yeah, and, and, and also I'm sure it's kind of implicit in what you're saying, but also the word to put these tools in clinical processes, to uh, align the incentives around them, to take care of the safety. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. And I think it's, you know, it may, it may seem attainable, but I, I what I expect organizations are going to find as they start to do it is it's going to seem like a never ending money pit. I think that's where vendors are going to come in. Yeah, yeah. But that's my, I want to hear from other people too. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, Salu? Yeah, no, I know I, what David said very much resonates. I mean, I think it's a little <laughs> biased given I'm also one of the, the vendors here. Um, but we actually, re I think recently put out a blog post talking about this where it's just, it's, it's just really hard to do this in-house. Um, and one is access to talent is challenging, right? I mean, I think you have people where this is all they've done and all they've studied and they're building companies like David around their knowledge and, and experience versus trying to try to hire and retain and you know kind of set that talent up for success within an organization is, is, is really challenging. I think there's other components around access to training data and in some of the conversations we had earlier around how do you make sure you have a representative sample and enough training data to draw the right types of inferences and, and kind of have the right types of results, I think is really challenging if you're trying to do that within a single company, whereas vendors have, again, this is their big focus and they also are working with many different companies and therefore are able to pull results across um, all the, you know, from all the different players that they're working with. Um, yeah. and, and then the piece is just the actual application side that we talked about is that how do you actually embed that in a usable way that is scalable, reliable, um, repeatable? Um, I think those are also a lot of core competencies that I think vendors are really thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. which may be hard to build um, internally. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, fair enough. So they just can I just, um, I, yeah, uh, to the extent that anybody can play counterpoint here, which I think is quite difficult, okay, okay. just pretty clear. Um, I, I think what Salu said around training data access is the critical piece here. Um, you know, one thing that surprised me as a medical trainee was how much sort of local dialects exist within healthcare, right? I trained in Boston. The Boston hospitals use acronyms that, as far as I can tell, aren't used anywhere else in the country, like Lenny's for ultrasounds and Ruckus for you know abdominal ultrasounds and other things that. I've, I've, I've used in, in uh, conversation with colleagues who don't know what I'm talking about, right? So I was thinking about that uh, when I was looking at some of the uh, abbreviation expansion capabilities, David, that you've written about, right? Would it know how to expand Lenny's if the data set doesn't include that ever, right? Um, and, and this is a problem, as you know, for both PHI privacy reasons, which are good reasons, and then sort of not so good reasons, which are just tribalism and uh, wild gardens and all of those things. So, you know, ideally the system is robust enough that it should be generalizable, universal, et cetera. Um, but it does require that there's representation and representation requires participation from institutions that historically have not. So th yeah. that's, a, that's a thing that technology can't solve on its own, right? It, it requires yeah, yeah. people and a will, but um, I just, just want to make that point. No, it's an excellent point. Um, thank you. And I, I mean, speaking about people and the final kind of question Heather is to you, um, you know, Heather kind of started the first data science, health data science program in a School of Public Health, I believe, um, uh, some years ago, and trains health data scientists who are going to work in some of these organizations. So like the people element is changing. Maybe some organizations have, have uh, more access to human resources. But, but Heather, what do you think? You know, on, you know, I, I guess you've got a number of your former students are working in healthcare organizations. Like, what do you think? Do you think it's like, un under what circumstances should these organizations be looking to do this kind of stuff themselves versus um looking to work with external organizations do you agree with what um Salu and Gaurav and David have said yeah um I I was going to say you know it all comes down to resources and Salu outlined that perfectly with the talent aka my students for part of that <laughs> um uh the computing power the data so it's if you if it takes Google with all of their resources almost a week to train this thing I'm sorry, you probably won't be able to do it in any kind of efficient timeline <laughs> to completely build a model from scratch. Um, what is kind of cool and it might work again with if you have the expertise, if you have the computing power, you have the data, taking these base models and fine tuning them or kind of customizing them to the data that you have, that will probably produce better results for your particular population or whoever your patients are or how you're going to implement this model. Um, but if you can get, I mean, obviously always happy to, you know, promote vendors and stuff. If you can have vendors to do all of that for you with all of that expertise, it'll probably save you a lot of time and a lot of money. So I think it, I guess it's like a, you know, a case by case basis, but um, definitely don't ever do it by scratch. <laughs> okay, I, mean, I think that's a pretty clear <laughs> folks. Um, uh, okay, so we're gonna kind of move over to the, I guess, audience uh, side of the discussion. I don't know, Nikki's been um, kind of fielding some questions. I mean, thank you all, there's an uh, amazing amount of them. So yeah, Nikki, I'll, um, over to you. Thanks, Tristan, and thanks everyone. Amazing discussion. So many questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, and anyone, you know, jump in as I, I I've been sort of curating some of these um, across the spectrum. So wanted to just start with um, more of a sort of fun one that comes to mind when you think of this topic, which is the IBM Watson one, right? So a lot of hype around that, a lot of work when I was at CVS, you know, lots of, of conversations about that too, and with them. Um, and Jeopardy, of course, um, you know, it was really a war that was everybody knew about this. Um, why now? And, you know, how will the current model succeed where Watson has failed? Okay, that is an interesting question. I think probably um, for kind of safety reasons, I suppose, we should probably stay away from specific critiques of specific solutions from specific that's groups. probably fair okay why why now why are these models going to be better than what came before maybe i'll take one stab at what i think is different now trisha um is um it's happening in the public domain to a large extent which i think is absolutely amazing um and maybe this is the the fact that the sort of uh, origin of open ai was such that you know th there there was a component of that but also 
for whatever reason, um, e even sort of for-profit actors have, again, shown their work to a large extent and made them available for experimentation. And there's a collective sort of analysis of what can and can't be done. Um, I think that's amazing. I haven't seen that with a new technology maybe ever of it's it, it sort of being, you know, pen tested by the entire universe right at once, um, which which I think is incredible um, and, and all publicly. So I think that's a recipe for very rapid evolution and improvement. You even see like, you know, there, there's this sort of uh, almost like jokey uh, approach to hacking open AI, uh, you know, GPT to say things that it's not supposed to. And within hours, right, it no longer works, right, because it's been patched. So it's it's almost that kind of thing that I think um, gives me gives me a lot of optimism that that this time is different. Okay. Um, anyone Great. else? It does also feel like the level of investment has just been soaring into this space. I mean, I think even if you look at OpenAI, Microsoft invested what something like three billion dollars to support them and their computing costs. Which, if you, I mean, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but if you look at this like twenty years ago or ten years ago or even five years ago, it feels like the that investment has been, you know, growing exponentially, which then just sets up the these models for success in that it, there is some, it does feel like there's some truth and David should weigh in here of more data, more training, more computing power does yield better results to, to you know, in, on some dimensions. And so I think that's also why we're probably seeing um, faster or more progress today than before. Yeah. And I think in other ways you could think about what we're seeing today as the natural progression of what the IBM Watson team very impressively did when they won Jeopardy over a decade ago, right? That that was due to major advances in the NLP field in question answering and particularly being able to translate what was known in the research community into something that could be used as a product. In this case, the product was for playing Jeopardy. That's what I'm referring to. And the resulting data sets that were created after that, um, I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I strongly suspect are the same data sets that are being used now for evaluating the current generation of systems. Great. Thank you, everyone. Oh, does anyone else want to jump in? No, we're good. So um, I think I wanted to focus first on the application, kind of there's a set of questions there, and then some of the more challenges and around driving adoption. So starting with the applications, there's some more specific questions. Um, one was around the ability of AI or ML to peruse and detect early signals of surges and trends in disease and health conditions on a population level, given everything we've been through, um, pretty topical. Um, anyone got any comments on, on how we can use AI and ML to, to really predict some of those top health uh, changes? Um, I guess, Gaurav, it's maybe analogous to like you're working with a lot of organizations who are looking at kind of real world evidence mm -hmm. for therapeutics, right? Um, uh, you yeah, know. I would say in some ways, a lot of that happened with like Google flu trends and some of the pandemic signaling stuff, even from search, forget large language models. But um, as a general sort of principle, um, it feels like that's the kind of thing that machine learning should be quite good at, right, is recognizing the early signals and connecting the dots. So. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I have an additional application. Yeah, for, sorry. I, I just give one more, another application. I think there's several mm -hmm. here, like from others. Okay. Um, but back at the start of the pandemic, I, I have a lot of friends who are clinicians on Twitter. And I was, I found it really interesting how everyone was posting what they're, what they were seeing in basically real time and following each other and learning about the pandemic and how to treat uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 from Twitter. And so we wrote a paper, uh, some MIT students and, my, and myself on how one could just take the Twitter feed and develop visualization methods to really understand what are the topics that are being discussed in this real time moment at the start of a pandemic um, in a way that others can quickly learn from it. Um, but it was very, challenging our approach. Um, I think if I were to, that, we wrote that paper uh, two year and year and a half ago, if I was to write that paper again today, what I would do is I would basically take the sequence of tweets that we would, um, that we would pull from different, uh, different posters. And I would feed that into a GBT like system. And I would say, summarize these for me. What are the main themes? What is, you know, and, and Actually, it would work quite well. And one, I think one could very rapidly build a much better system for doing that than what, than what I had built. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing what time can do in this world. It's really compressed. Um, 
I wanted to bring up mental health and sort of the social services. So there was a question around applications into social work and human services. If you think about caseloads and burnouts there, even further than you know what we've been seeing in general on the, on the physical health side and why a lot of applications have been at least to date in the examples we talked about more on the physical side. So any comments, I don't know, Salu, in the work that you're doing or others, um, as we think about the mental health area, either the professionals offering that or some of the apps you mentioned in terms of servicing patients and how you manage that, right, in terms of in the context of HIPAA and, and what you can actually provide using AI and apps to patients. I know, I think it's a it's a really important space. And I think definitely, as we've seen with COVID, I think the, the attention on mental health has is so important. And so it, it does feel like some of the applications that we talked about earlier in terms of patient engagement um, and provider engagement could also apply in the mental health space it, to be honest like, this is not a area that I am that I'm an expert in by any means though I do have two psychiatrist parents uh, so I should probably um, know more about this than than, um, than I do um, but yeah I, I think that's part of what what we've seen is is there are there ways to engage patients get access to care or help guide them to the right care models um, and and you know kind of some of what Gore was saying of based on searches signal where there might be interventions required. Um, that, that those could be all really interesting applications on the mental health side. Yeah. So what are some others, other thoughts on this? Well one thing just to flag, I think there was a lot of uh, controversy on Twitter a couple of weeks ago about basically an unannounced experiment that was done uh, with a sort of like telemental health provider um, substituting AI um, uh, you know, for a human. And, you know, technology will enable us to do a lot of things, but there's sort of core principles of research, for example, and especially when you're interacting with a potentially very dangerous circumstance, right, or, or human health, where we can't forget IRBs and sort of basic protocols of safety, um, to say loose point. So, you know, th there's, for, feels like there's a lot of potential, right? It feels like content generation, again, if, if I think about my, like, simple mental model, could be quite valuable there. Um, but, you um, but, but of course, still have to abide by the safeguards. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And um, when we think about EMRs and EHRs, um, I don't know the answer about, you know, whether this there's a blockage in terms of the use of GPT-3 or what, what needs to actually happen to accelerate adoption um, in sort of documentation and within or adjacent to H EHRs. David should take this since he's actually done it. Indeed. So, so there are a couple of different use cases to highlight there. One would be one which takes existing clinical notes after they've been written and tries to extract information from them, very much along the lines of what Mendel's core product does. So our new product is tackling the same problem, um, but is using GPT-3 and its competitors, like so Anthropic, for example, works very well for this as well, um, in order to do that extraction of, of information from clinical notes. And there, some of the challenges that I mentioned uh, and the follow-ups that say Lou and Gaurav mentioned are very much relevant. So I won't repeat those. Mm -hmm. On the other side, it's how can we get into the clinical workflow where um, clinicians, are, clinicians, nurses, uh, um, scribes are documenting and uh, and actually improve that, improve that documentation process directly in the loop. And there, the major challenges are around getting where getting into the workflow where clinicians are today rather than having to them step outside of the workflow so how does one integrate into Cerner epic and the major electronic medical records so that what you're building looks invisible to the end user but yet really augments them to, to help them do their job better and that is a major challenge and it's one that's going to require both big engineering effort and uh, the use of new uh, a apis and open standards that have recently come about and cooperation from the major commercial ehrs companies Thank you. Um, so I think there's, we could go on um, about use cases, but there's also so many questions around thriving adoption, improving any adoption that's been made so far. Um, one question that came up was around which stakeholders would pay for this. And I know there's been talk of, you know, whether we need reimbursement codes um, at a, radi a la radiology or others to um, ensure that these do get paid for and how we think about payment within the existing system. Um, as Trisha and Nikhil and others in a paper recently mentioned, or um, you know, going direct to consumer or other methods. So we'd love to hear um, your thoughts, um, and again, open to, to anyone on the panel on, on reimbursement and where we might see most of the early adoption. I think the short answer to that is Satya Nadella, but, um, but we can have a, a, a broader discussion about it. <laughs> 
Thanks, Gaurav. Anyone else? Well, okay, yeah. So, I mean, as... as you, yeah, yeah <laughs> we did write something uh, uh, on that. It's on HBO. I think it's called uh, Winning Business Models or Business Models for AI in, 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 um, in Healthcare. And I think you kind of described the different options here, right? One is uh, looking at something that is... Um, already reimbursed or is already paid for and increasing the efficiency of that that thing or increasing the effectiveness uh, of it and then it's like in all of these areas of new workflows and that's much much more tricky and there isn't really a general prescription uh, for that um, and then I guess the third thing which is typical of all these technologies and I think we should also be cognizant of it you know there will be some jobs definitely it's kind of impossible uh, that, that will be will go away because like new technology has evolved. And that's kind of, I guess the broad thing is like, how many of us are farmers? How many of us were farmers a hundred years ago? Or our relatives were, were farmers a hundred years ago. It's like a radically different proportion, but there'll be lots of new workflows, new jobs, new opportunities that are created by the technology as well. I hope, and certainly it's what, you know, I was kind of working on before this is that like uh, having patients be more involved as uh, meaningful co-producers of their own health outcomes taking you know instrumenting that process putting these technologies in play to like make the best use of the clinical resources that are also deployed outside the hospital um so yeah i mean i think you know rather than kind of rehash the paper in like a 20 minute monologue it's just best to kind of have <laughs> it's free totally fair um it's a good tee up for you so i think we've got some, some good materials and we can share all of these um, the next one's around regulation and um, how important that is. And I think we've hinted at it in a few places in the discussion, but how have or are groups like the FDA getting comfortable, um, becoming more active in this area? How do we create sort of standards um, for show your work validations? Again, please uh, jump in. That's a great question. Heather, is this something you cover on your course? Unfortunately, no, but I should. <laughs> it's a huge area. And the 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 hard part is is just that it, we're kind of just in the beginning stages of it. Um, with regulatory bodies like the FDA getting involved and seeing algorithms as like um, software as a service and having uh, regulations for those. Um, I don't know about language models at the moment, if there's anything happening in terms of regulation with that. But the issue is, you know, if something, when something goes wrong, who's at fault, who, right. you know, which stakeholders are, are to blame, hold accountable, all of those things. Um, who judges what amount of harm can be done um, at scale? Uh, you know, what is the context and the purpose of, of the model? And so it's a very, hot topic, I guess, and people are, there's a lot of discussion around it. There's just, you know, it's a, again, it's kind of in its infancy and we're kind of just figuring it out now, I think. Uh, we have a, a paper about regulation, Trisha and I, um, that I can, I can link as well. That'd be great. A lot of reading material from this, this course. And um, Sadie, you uh, would love to hear from you. Yeah, one thing I was just going to add is I, I I totally agree with Heather that I think this is very much an infancy and you know and Gaurav you've you've certainly encountered some of this with with your work at Foundation Medicine around real world evidence where this is something where the you know I think just as a body real world evidence is relatively new and I think the FDA is still trying to figure out how to incorporate that data source especially EHR generated real world evidence um, among you know, kind of traditional clinical trial data, claims data, other other data sources that it has more experience with. And I think it's just starting to put out guidance on this topic. And I think the most recent draft guidance that they had did include some language around incorporating AI generated data. And I think um, a lot of it was around understanding traceability and understanding source evidence and making sure that the algorithms weren't black box. So I think some of the work that David was citing is is really important if we can start to make that uh, more the evidence that these models are using more apparent I think will build confidence in having these regulatory bodies accept the data and and understand how to use insights generated from that data so I think that that's where it feels like we need to have more partnership between regulators and 
um, you know, kind of companies that are generating the data, companies that are analyzing the data and you know, kind of packaging up evidence. I think having all of us talk more openly together about the strengths and limitations of everything that we're coming from and, and what use cases it can solve, what use cases it may not be ready for yet, and how do we make sure we're making all of that much more transparent, I think is going to be important to, to really capitalize on the promise of all of these technologies. Great. Thanks, Sanu. Anyone else? It's a big topic. Uh, might be a whole other topic for us in the future. Um, so this is a broad question. I know we've touched on it, but it would be really helpful as we think about it, you know, the driving adoption, the use cases. This question is, what are the biggest threats to chat GPT-3 or just general adoption? As you're answering, if you could maybe pick one and then, you know, uh, well, what might the, the solve for that be? Uh, what would be the next step you would take? If you could just change one thing to move this all along to where we all want it to be, um, if we can even imagine what that looks like, where would you start? And um, anyone can jump in, but I might have to to call people otherwise. <laughs> I can start. Um, we've covered it a bit already, so it's a little bit of a rehash, but ultimately trust is going to be critical um, if we're using it for, you know, a bunch of the healthcare applications that we're really excited about. Um, again, if I, I just think about the hype curve that took place sort of publicly on Twitter, it was like the first three days it came out, it was, you know, holy cow, holy cow, holy cow. And then I, I remember this one thread where you could see literally the light bulb going off where a doc posted a use case of using it to generate a prior auth sort of response to a payer. And there's like 20 replies that say, this is amazing. I'm going to start using this in my practice. And the 24th response is, I looked up the references and they're all fake, right? And of course, that's now been replicated a number of times, but it only takes one or two things like that to erode trust in the whole thing. So, um, you know, especially when it's solvable, as David has shared with us earlier, um, that shouldn't actually be a threat, but there's the sort of reality of the threat and then there's the perception and what it does to sort of core beliefs. And those once shaken are often hard to rebuild. So, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where... I don't think we actually know what it can do and what it can't do, even the people who created it. And so it's a little bit of we're learning what the black black box does by throwing things into it and seeing what comes out, right? And uh, and in that process, I think just expectation management, while at the same time sort of rapidly pushing uh, the the research efforts that David described um, to build trust and transparency, th th those feel critical to me. Right, and as Sadie said as well, the documentation piece. You know, where is this coming from? Um, I would love to hear from if, others. If anyone wants to look up these terms later, um, the term that's used by the research community is hallucinations. Uh, and for the information that is often output that is not grounded in either the input document or that or uh, other places. Thank you, David. And while you're there, um, one thing you could change to move this all forward, biggest threat. I think from... The business perspective, it's finding the right use cases that um, that both navigate the safety concerns that we were referring to, right? So uh, low risk, high return, um, and at the same time, uh, set the stage for future growth. So I think we, we it's going to be really interesting to see what those use cases are that the community comes up with. I think that the biggest threat is that everyone is focused on the same use case that ends up not being the one which is actually valuable from a business perspective. Nikki, I think you're frozen. Oh no. I was frozen? No, no, I think Nikki is. Um, Yes, Nikki is frozen. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, let's see, Trisha, right. can you see the Q and A? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And yeah. hopefully, we'll hear from her if she jumps back in. I'd also like to take a moment to tell everybody. Sorry for somebody, Susan Calcio. I'm Susan Calcio. Somehow, a link must have gotten interested, corrupted as far as everybody joining. But um, it's a party, so I hope you're all saying good things under my name. And Trisha, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um. Cool. All right. So we've got a number of different questions here. There's a lot, actually. So I'm looking at them kind of for the first time. Um, just give me one second. Uh, ah, OK, this is interesting. Um, uh, the response of search engines tends to give priority to sponsors. Will this be an issue with large language models? 
Uh, Trisha, I, I think it's a super interesting question. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz about it, even in the last couple of days since um, since Microsoft announced their intent to use it as as a way of, uh, you know, hopefully leapfrogging Google. And you know, how monetizable is it, right? In Google, it's pretty clear. You put sponsored search results up top. People bid on them. They they sort of made tremendous innovations there. What does that look like in a large language model sort of world in which you're? It's like the Ask Jeeves has returned, right? Sort of ask a question and get the result. Um, and you know, my guess is that the answer is probably not known. I'm sure Microsoft and others have their theories of how to monetize that. One thing that I've heard um, people say is, well, it may not be the search result, but the thing that happens after the search result, right, that is monetized then, which in yeah. some ways is actually quite attractive, right? Because you know, you don't corrupt the search result. The, the answer to the question is pure, um, but the thing that you may want to do afterward is the is the point of monetization and. You know, obviously it's speculation. There's probably many other ways. Curious if other people have other ideas. Another open question is: Is it is it as lucrative as the prioritized search results? And if not, what will that mean for uh, for profit for profit entities that that will have to make tough decisions there? So I think fascinating questions, especially given how important advertising has been to the rise of the open and free internet. So I, I don't know how, how much talking. revenue comes from the prioritized search results versus just ads. Uh, so I was using those as the same thing, the the ads. Ah, but but the ad, but the ads what you could still show, right? So you could still show ads on top and then have your GPT three based answer. Yes. Um, Mickey, welcome back. Uh, you're on mute at the moment. Okay, it's a long hit. Sorry. Sorry about that. I just had a lot of windows open. Uh, the, the joys of technology, right? Really amazing, but for the one percent when it doesn't work, not so good. My life, um, right? It's done nice. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I know one of these cases was also, um, you know, as we think about the frontline sales reps and, and how they can actually benefit from using AI, I think that's an interesting one. We often talk about the drug development process, but as we think about those in the front lines, they can read and read, but how do they surface what's most relevant? How do you think about that? And how is that different to, to other use cases we talked about? The sales enablement. David, I know you've got a bunch yeah. of experience there. No, you haven't got a bunch of experience. Okay. So okay. If not, we can, we can move on. That's okay. Um, another question was around um, sort of in, the, in that same realm of, uh, you know, life sciences and uh, thinking about that. Um, you know, there was some around paperwork for nurses, which I think we've sort of talked about, right, is this documentation with the caveat that it's going to be more summarized. And then some interesting comments around what's that doing for the role of the doctor? And isn't it, you know, the integrity and the responsibility of the doctor are to be connected with that patient. And if you've got an algorithm summarizing it or even doing the discharge, then is that real, really patient care? And I, I mean, that's a very esoteric yeah. question, but any, any comments on, on where the sort of parameters are and, and what's in and what's out? Um, yeah, if anyone wants to have a go, they're welcome. Otherwise I've definitely got a point of view here. Go okay, so so, um, okay. so 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 I think I, I think there's two things to think about here, right? I think one in the let's just start with the long run. I think it's totally reasonable that like this dyad of a consultation, two experts meeting, patient expert in their life and how the illness affects them and its consequences, clinician, I'll say broadly rather than a doctor, expert in you know in medicine and stuff, I suppose. Um, and meeting this meeting of experts to like that's the kind of like the the indivisible unit of, of, of historically now um that is probably still going to continue i mean there'll be more things that are done with like technology and vigilance and extending healthcare with digital tools and more kind of automated processes there but but that consultation will remain and this question is germane and you essentially have i think there's two points of view here uh, which are complementary one is that there's no clinicians like documenting stuff. Uh, it by its, there was a hell of a lot of pushback. I'm old enough to like when EMRs were introduced, and there was so much pushback around. Like now, the screen is in the middle of the consultation is basically terrible. I'm not looking at the patient. I'm looking at this. I'm thinking about what document. I'm getting uh, spammed by this and that. There was massive pushback around that. Now, of course, it's established. Everyone's like, yeah, of course, we have to have a screen. As always, how do we know what's going on? And like whatever. So like those things change over time. Um, and so, firstly, I think a lot of efficiency gain 
that will be there for, for clinicians from the kind of technologies that we're describing here. And I think the kind of ambient assistant type approach is very far along with a number of different organizations, both big and small. And I think we're in kind of very short order we'll start getting that in more kind of mainstream practice. There's certainly research or kind of, what's the word, like alpha implementations in a number of um, uh, different medical centers. I think the, 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 the second point, I think was way more interesting from my point of view at least, is that I think there'll be clinical models where it won't just be this dyad. There will be a third party, which is essentially kind of the retraining or the specific optimization of a lang some kind of AI presence uh, that the patient, the person will interact with in between visits, before visits, uh, will can maybe interact with maybe more of the administrative stuff, maybe more of the coaching type things, and that will have a persona. It will feel like care. It will be part of the process of delivering care. The clinician and the patient will both be motivated to make that thing know as much as it can and such the patient can interact with it. And I believe personally, and anyone obviously else, feel free to kind of agree or push back on that point. That's the way things are going to go. Well, anyone got a last parting word? You think you you may have, have had that one, Trishan, um, uh, but yeah. I'll let you finish up because I know we're yeah, yeah. at. Okay. Um, so thank you, everyone. Sorry, I didn't realize we actually had time there. So, um, okay, so this was, this was 90 minutes long, uh, much longer than we've done before. I have to thank all of the panelists, we had some questions that we thought we'd ask, we asked very few of them. And it was a very organic conversation. So I have to thank them all for being here, an hour and a half in the middle of their day, thinking on their feet, uh, to thank the HBS Alumni Association and uh, Harvard Chan uh, Alumni Relations for putting this on, uh, and for making it freely available for everyone. And all of you for turning up. Um, it wouldn't have been the same. We do it live uh, for a reason, because there's something about it being done in one take with um, all of the kind of things that can go wrong uh, during that and with all of you all around the world, some of you now in the future, um, uh, logging in. So we thank you for sharing this moment with us. We're probably going to do others. I think we're probably going to do others, but we'd have to do some planning. So if you have any ideas around particular subjects that you want us to explore, large language models, I think is going to be the theme that we're going to go, go through here, then please let me know. I guess just final quick thing from everyone. If people want to find out more about your work uh, and or to contact you, uh, if you don't want to give out your contact details, it's probably totally fine. Um, uh, how can they do that? So maybe if I just start with Gaurav because you're um, first on the, on the list. Yeah, always happy to chat. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and elsewhere. So please find me. Amazing. Okay, uh, David? Uh, that's probably the easiest way as well. I, I'd love to talk to folks who are interested in both the research and the products that I, I spoke about. Amazing. Thanks, David. Heather? Same thing. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Um, Sayle? Yeah, same. Really excited. This is a great topic and always happy to chat. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, if you want the slides, um, just let us know. We'll, we'll send them to you for, for, for what they're worth or just make them yourself by using ChatGPT. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you very much. Till next time. Thank you, Trisha and Nikki. In Thank you all so much. This is Susan Calcio featured prominently all over your webinar today. Don't know how that happened, but I'm excited about the name recognition now. Um, and I will be sending the recording, the slides, and anything else I can put in an email to anybody's emails I can find related to this. So uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Cheers.